Hi, I'm Annika Nora. I am a former, I don't really like using the word former or retired, Team GB track and field athlete. I competed in the sprints for Great Britain. I won multiple medals, multiple global medals in the European Championships, Commonwealth Games, World Championships and also the Olympic Games as well. I am now recently an author, which has been amazing. It's been a real ride. And I'm currently working as a consultant as my day job. But I, and to add to that, I'm also between my home city in Liverpool and I'm also in London as well. What was your childhood like? Did you have siblings? Were you a sporty little girl? Were you more into the academics? Were you a mix of everything? So I really enjoyed competitive sports. I came from a really, really competitive family. So um, my brother was a professional footballer back in the 90s. You know, he was like one of the people I always looked up to. So shout out to Ifem. And my my other siblings as well, because there's nine of us in total. They also played various sports like track, basketball, football as well. Um, so yeah, girls and boys. So everyone was pretty sporty, but I guess it was me. The EFM who took it to professional level. I also loved, I guess, track. And that's kind of how I fell in love with the sport, you know, from school sports day, winning events, and then getting scouted, and then realizing, oh, I'm actually quite good at this. And then it, it just kind of snowballed into a great thing, which led me to a successful international career in athletics. I mean, thinking back to when you were a little girl. Do you remember what you wanted to be or what you wanted to do? Did you ever think that you could grow up to become a professional athlete? Was that ever sort of an an option? Do you know what? I feel like it was an option, but I didn't know to what extent. In terms of what I wanted to do, I was just so ambitious. I was super shy, but I was really ambitious. So I had all dreams of like different things, of things I wanted. So I was obsessed with music and I still am. I used to always watch Total Pop, so I really wanted to be not so much a singer, but more a dancer. So I, I, I actually used to go to dancing school when I was very little. And then I guess track and other things kind of got in the way. And then I found other passions as well. I think I knew I was sporty at a young age and I knew I wanted to get into it. But, you know, in the UK, there's not really a consistent understanding of how it works compared to maybe the collegiate system. So in the US, you've got the NCAAs and, you know, you go to high school and then you go to college. And then during those years in college, you compete for the university. And then if you're one of the best athletes in the NCAA in a particular school, then you get signed straight away once you leave. So you get a shoe contract with Nike or uh, Adidas or whoever. Whereas in the UK, (laughs) it's very different. So you just kind of, go to school, go to college or university, or you don't. And you just, if you're a really good junior athlete, you go straight into professional sports. But coming from the family background I did, there was absolutely no way that my dad was going to let me do professional sports at like the age of 16, 17. So I had to make sure I had my degree to make sure, you know, everything was backed up. And yeah, I was able to balance studying with, you know, competing as a full-time track athlete as, as well, which was hard. But once I graduated, it allowed me to fulfil my passion. Looking back, I mean, obviously, bearing in mind, obviously, what you have achieved, that, but there was that element of sacrifice. Do you sort of re- regret not maybe having the college years that you could have had? No, you know, I don't. <laughs> no, fair enough, do not, fair enough. No, everyone asked me that. And I think um, it, it taught me a lot in, in school, in school, in university. Um, I never had things easy. I actually enjoyed working hard for things. So I was never fed with a silver spoon. I wasn't given any handouts. My family, we never came for, I never came from a rich family. So everything I had, I had to work for. So if I took my foot off the gas, at any moment and you know it was like oh let me just go and go on a student night or let me just stay up late and do this I wasn't able to and also because you'd see so many athletes do the same thing during those years of you know becoming a really good junior and then transitioning into the senior years that period is so hard because you can be a really good junior and there's no guarantees that you're actually going to make it at a senior level and then be consistent 
especially in events like the sprints, so the 100 meters, 200 meters, where you've got ongoing competition with several of your competitors. And then you've got to think about, you know, the impact injury also has on your body. So, yeah, I just was just fully focused on competing and training and making sure that my assignments were handed in on time. So you just said making it at the senior level, there's almost like these different stages and then being consistent. Was, do you remember there being a point in your career when you were made it to the senior level and you were being consistent and that you felt comfortable sort of ready like you, I don't know like you felt like you belonged and that you were like yes this is this is my profession this is what I'm going to be doing uh yeah I think it came probably when I competed at my first senior championship so when I was I think I was around 20 maybe 21 ish and I competed at the Commonwealth Games in Australia so in Melbourne Australia I think that was the first championship. So I, re- I realized what it was like to be a professional athlete and be amongst your peers. I'm on teams with people who I used to look up to on TV. And now I'm like sitting next to them in the food hall or I'm sharing an apartment with them. And, you know, you're just kind of, you're just trying to give, they're giving you advice about how to, you know, conduct yourself as you, you know, progress through the sport. And then, yeah, when you're competing in stadiums like the MCJ in Melbourne and it's like, you know, 70,000 people and they're just screaming for, you know, the local Australian girl at the, at the time. But, you know, you're trying to block that out and just focus, but just realise, oh, wow, I've, I've really stepped into this moment. And then also you find yourself through failure. So, you know, I failed more times than I had wins. And, you know, we only get better through those failures. And... I'm thankful for each and every one of them, good and bad, because it taught me so much about myself along the way. So I think the experience from those formative years transitioning into the senior level just taught me a lot as I came up in the sport. Yeah. In terms of support, like I, I, and it'll be really interesting for, from your perspective as well, you know, sort of almost spending, is it about 20 years, 17 years? Yeah, yeah. not too long. On that. <laughs> Did you notice a change, especially with regards to, I suppose, like the mental support that athletes received, whether it was talking to psychologists, having help overcoming failures or setbacks or obstacles, but also when you make different transitions. So either you know, after the Rio Olympics or, or when you sort of retire, retired and, you know, make a change. Did you have like uh, mental support in place to, to help you? No, I don't believe I did. I don't believe I did. You know, those years when, or around that time when I retired, there was mainly track athletes, you know, my friends, my teammates who reached out or people who'd followed my career. But there wasn't really that much support once I'd actually retired. It was more a case of, you know, congratulations and wishing you all the best. (laughs) <laughs> that you know that was pretty much it that was a standard you know go-to message it wasn't like we're here for you if you need any support you know what are your next steps there was absolutely none of that that conversation never had <laughs> I mean I'm not I'm not obviously I'm not still waiting for it but <laughs> it would have been nice had I had those conversations you know but I also didn't wait for that so I didn't expect that neither and the reason being is because I think this applies to most athletes. We are disposable. So you've got your, you know, your years, primitive years of competing at high level sports, whether it's track and field, hockey, football or whatever. And then you've got a kid who's coming up or you've got several Annikas who are coming up and they're trying to emulate everything that you've achieved. So once you've kind of moved on, then you've got the next group and the next crop who are coming up and they're going to be the the next the new face and they're they're going to be like the future and you know they're going to be the ones who are part of this new legacy and whatever so basically what I'm trying to say is the nicest possible way once you've been shown the back door like that's pretty much it for the most part you're on your own in terms of how you want to figure things out I kind of wish I'd done things differently in the sense that you know which I mentioned in the book, you know, financially, I dedicated a lot to the sport. I never was financially set. 
So, you know, you ask yourself different questions, like, what am I going to do? But people assume, there's this massive assumption that when you win an Olympic medal, you're a millionaire or you've, you're going to get endorsements and you're going to get this and that and the other. And I think years ago, as a British athlete, like maybe 2012 or, or 2008 prior, those Olympians who medaled, yes, you could definitely make money off it. It could be lucrative. But like now in this day and age, it, it doesn't work like that. So, you know, you either have to find things on your own or you have to just kind of assume that you're going to have, have help and support from your family, your friends, your agent, um, several sponsors or whatever. But the margins are so fine and short that, you know, the same rules don't apply to everyone. So, yeah, I definitely wish I had that support. And even now, the ongoing support since then. I just want to talk to you about that pressure, you know, that pressure to perform, that pressure to to be consistent to also the pressure of knowing that age is a, is a factor and that, you know, you're getting older and, you know, at some point you will peak and trying to obviously peak at the Olympics and, you know, achieve the, the best result that you can possibly deal. And then being out on the track, how do you handle pressure? How do you handle stress? Oh, gosh. In terms of me handling pressure, I think I got better with pressure as I got older. But sometimes the expectations can weigh you down, especially when, you know, I moved from the ones and twos to then purely the 400s. So once I moved to the 400, not only was there an expectation for me to perform well, but there was also an expectation for me to always split really fast on the on the women's four by four. And during those, you know, formative years of us being consistently amazing, and just meddling, you always had to make sure you were part of that medal winning team. So even though the expectations were being set by other people, I also had my own expectations. But to be honest, in terms of pressure, I just try to block it out as much as I can. I had an amazing, amazing psychologist and he would just give me cues and little things to focus on because, you know, sometimes the stress and the pressure can be extremely overwhelming. In the book, I mentioned about the race off between me and Christina Hurugu for the Rio Olympic spot. And that was pressure, <laughs> you know, that was pressure. And it was pressure because if it, I think it was, if it was any other athletes, it was, it'd be fine. But I think because of the relationship that I had with Christina, it made it 10 times hard. You want to be able to support her. She wants to be able to support you, but ultimately it's first place and past the post in order to get a medal, in order to make the team and get that spot. So, yeah, I just, I try to remember my cues and I don't look in the crowds when I come out on, from the call room to the stadium. I don't listen out for people. I just always had the same thing and it was always simplified. Sometimes I'd sing in my head when, you know, when you're not allowed music in the call room or sometimes my battery on my iPod would die, <laughs> So which would happen often. So I would um, just end up sit, just singing in my head. Sometimes it's basic things like just smiling, just having a chuckle to yourself, just releasing that stress and pressure. And when you have a moment of like clarity, I remember to smile and I think of something funny. So I know I know it sounds very odd and I feel like I'm going around in circles, but I just had so many different things to help me deal with the pressure. And I think all of those different elements also help help me to become successful and perform at top level. One of the things that athletes talk about when they are performing at top level and, and you wrote about it in your book was, you, you know, when everything comes together and you're in flow and sync and your body and your mind is all sort of connecting. And I honestly, I, I don't even know how easy it is for you to to try and describe that. But would you like to share you know, I'm sure it's obviously it's happened more than more than more than one time. But, you know, when that does happen, you know, how does that feel? What's going through through your head when you're in that flow and, and just everything is just connecting and working? Oh, it's a great feeling. <laughs> it's a really, really good feeling. It's not so much about you always winning. Like in the 400, you could kind of see when you're coming off the 10 or when you're at 200, you can kind of get a sense of, where you could potentially place and you just kind of remember all those different cues that my coach used to give me 
So I think, yeah, to, when you're in full flow and when everything's working and you're just focused, even when you've got like the lactic building and it's just sitting there, you just think to yourself, yeah, this is such, it's such a good feeling. It really is. Like when I ran my personal bests in 2015, so it was at the World Champs in Beijing in the, in the heat in the first round and then in the semi-final. I don't remember getting lactic. Like, yes, you feel tired, but you don't really feel like the lactic is sitting there and you're forcing yourself to the finish line. You just feel like you've got to go through those cues and you're doing what you can to run as fast as you can, but also technically make everything technically efficient. And because I used to challenge myself just to see how much in sync everything feels, I always wanted that feeling. So as an athlete, all you want to be able to do is replicate that same feeling. And at times it can be hard because, you know, sometimes you think, oh, the conditions aren't always right. And, you know, you might be carrying an injury or, I mean, sometimes as a woman, you end up running on your period at like a major championship as well. So you've got to think, sometimes you just got to just think about all these things, but at the same time, just block it all out and give yourself the best opportunity every single time you step on the start line and yeah I think every time I did I always made sure I got the best out of my performances. You headed over to to Rio to the Olympic Games to take part in the 4x400 um, relay which you ended up getting a bronze medal at massive massive congratulations but that's sort of only half the story because I was I was fascinated to read in your book about what had happened you know, sort of 10 months previously. Would you like to share a little bit more about what happened at that time in your life? It was 2015 season and I just finished a successful championship. And then in the off season, which is around September, October time, take a couple of weeks break. And this particular season, off season, I went on two holidays. So first one was to uh, visit my family and friends in Nigeria. So this is something I do every year just to decompress and I guess reconnect with my family, my heritage, my culture. And, you know, I tried to go back every year or every other year. And I went back with my mom. Unfortunately, I, I went there and I contracted malaria, which I didn't know about. I actually didn't know I had it, given the, the type of um, strain that I had. So mine was like this, uh, I forgot what it's called, fal- falsa capsum or something. It's one of those long names. And it was, it was a slow, deadly one. So most people who've had, if you live in a tropical climate, people tend to know when they got, when they have malaria, when they contracted it. But because I got it towards the end of the trip, and then I came, literally flew back into the UK. And then like the next day or two, I flew to the Dominican Republic with my boyfriend. So that trip (laughs) was just ruined because it was just, awful you know I was um I think after the third day that's when the symptoms really started to kick in so it was just you know vomiting and just being sick and you know the hot and cold sweats and yeah I just couldn't wait to get back home and then when I eventually got home 10 days later all the symptoms had stopped and then the next day once I got back into winter training all the symptoms picked back up again and then because of that that's when you know I had blood and urine tests and the doctors said that you need to go and see a kidney specialist because they feel like, you know, there's something wrong with your kidneys. So I had to drive to St. John's Woods in London um, Hospital and to see a kidney specialist. You know, when I got there, it was just absolute agony, absolute pain. And then once I was admitted, because they couldn't see me, they couldn't, di- they needed to diagnose me to see what was wrong with me because they, they knew it was something serious. That's when they discovered I had malaria. So yeah, I was in hospital with malaria and I remember the specialist was like, yeah, you got a small dose of malaria. And oh, I was like, are you joking? Like, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to die and you're telling me it's like a tiny dose. I'm like, no, these parasites are like literally taking over my body. So yeah, um, I was in hospital for around eight, nine days. And then, yeah, I was released. Well, I kind of forced myself to leave because you know, I just wanted to see if I could get back and start back training and recover properly. And then, yes, 10 months later, I got the Olympic medal. So it's definitely something to tell the grandchildren. I think one of the hardest things is that you that you didn't tell any, well, you Yeah, or you made the decision not to sort of tell anybody because 
um, you obviously you don't want other competitors knowing that you're not in full fitness because there's also then they, they almost have like a psychological advantage over you so you're almost having to go through this and keeping it all quiet how was it getting back to full fitness knowing that you've got the Olympics coming up well, obviously you know you're motivated but did you feel as though it was just this like uphill struggle do you know what it, it did but I just blocked everything out mm. I didn't give myself a chance to wallow or feel depressed or anything I even remember I didn't I don't I was thinking back even when I was writing the book and I don't think I cried all year like from the moment I contracted malaria in October 2015 when I was in hospital that's when I cried but then I don't think I once even once I'd been discharged and you know got my health better and started training again I didn't cry until until I probably missed the um where did I I finished fourth in the Olympic trials that was the first time I cried before that it was like no because the way I got my body back to where it needed to be by you know November December time I was pretty much good to go. And then, you know, it wasn't a case of me making up for lost time because I'd already lost about maybe six six weeks of training. But I actually didn't lose that much in essence. And then when it came to January, February, like everything, I was just on track. Like I was fit, I was healthy. I was just focused, I was determined. And I just always made a conscious decision to not tell anyone. I mean, partly because of the reason you did mention, you know, you don't you don't want people to have that advantage over you, especially when it does come to your competitors. But at the same time, if you know me and if you knew the person I was and around that time when I was competing, I just wanted to focus on getting the job done. You know, the Olympic year, any Olympic year is so stressful. <laughs> it's, it's extremely stressful because you can have a really good year the year before. You can have a really good year the year after the Olympics, but it's it's the Olympics that everyone wants to make. So you have to perform during the season. You have to perform at uh, the British Olympic trials and you have to go to the Olympics and get the job done. And I think um, I was doing a great job of doing it up till I contracted malaria. But I don't look back and think, oh, imagine, I, w- I wonder what life would have looked like if I hadn't contracted malaria. Would I have performed the way I did? Would I have won the t- won not been in a position where I'd missed out on an individual. Sometimes, honestly, you just don't know. But I'm just grateful to be able to walk away with something that um, I've been working hard towards my whole life. Let's go to Rio. Let's take us back to Rio and your experience in Rio, being at the Olympics, competing for Team GB, obviously winning the bronze medal in the 4x400. What are some of the highlights that you look back on, um, which just makes you smile and you're just like, like, holy crap, like you won a bronze medal at the Olympics. Like, it's just so incredible. Oh, it's, you know what? It's, oh, it's, it was such like a breathtaking moment, like one of the best moments ever. Um, I don't really remember much of the race unless I watch it back on YouTube, but I remember pretty much everything that happened after that. Like, you get that medal and you win it and you're on the podium and then you're doing press and media. I actually recorded everything for the next 48 hours. So because of the time difference and because we were like one of the last teams to medal, one of the last events on teams to medal for Team GB at the time, we were doing media literally five, six o'clock in the morning till 3 p.m. in the afternoon and we were absolutely shattered because I only had like 45 minutes sleep by the time I got back to the village but you were buzzing because this is this is like yeah you want this moment this is you know you should be able to have people ask you questions and you know interview you and all the exciting good bits that come along with you know meddling so yeah it was great and just seeing all those people around me and you know, calling my family and friends and they were like screaming down the phone <laughs> saying that they were up and they were having like drinks and just celebrating that I won the medal. And and yeah, it's, it's like you can't buy those moments. You really can't, especially for the people who've been around me my whole life and whole career who've watched me go through so much to get to that moment. It was an amazing achievement, but it made me realise that, you know, I was never on this journey alone. Even though, you know, I was one of my individual races and, you know, winning as part of the relay team. But 
the journey itself, I was never alone, especially in that Olympic year where I was in hospital 10 months beforehand. So it definitely made everything worthwhile. How much does fitness and sport and exercise play a role in your life now? Like, what does, like, are you still, you know, hitting the gym? Do you go for like little runs? Do you, are you still a member of a running club? <laughs> So I actually do not run as much as I, I don't know. I don't know whether I, sh- I should say probably should or probably would like to. I think I have found other interests. So during lockdown, I discovered roller skating. I really, really enjoyed that. And I still want to do I, I need to go back into it, to be fair. Um, but I really do that because, you know, it was all those sports and all those things that I could never do when I was competing because, you know, you don't want to get injured. You don't want to get hurt and all of those things that, you know, I never got the opportunity to do. So I'm doing stuff like that now. I like to play tennis. I actually do go to the gym first thing in the morning. I try to go three to four times a week minimum. And I have, I literally give myself an hour or an hour and a half, depending on how much I want to do. I think in the beginning, once I retired, because it was just before lockdown, I didn't really, no, 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 I did, sorry, I did, because I was in Loughborough. I joined a gym, and what I realised is I didn't like working out by myself, so I used to just go to the classes, because the thing is, when you go to classes, it forces you to get 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 it together, basically. You don't want to be that person in the class who's slacking. I would join yoga classes, hot yoga, uh, Pilates, you know, trying to maintain some sort of flexibility. I would join strength and conditioning classes. And sometimes the instructor would be like, um, do you like want to, do you want to take over this class? Because I feel like it's so much more advanced <laughs> than what you do. And I was like, no, no, I, 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 you know, I'm just happy to just be a part of it. And yeah, even now I, I try to go to aerial yoga. So I love, love, love aerial yoga. I always try to challenge myself in doing different things. But in terms of actual track, in terms of track and field, I don't, I, I, I was adamant I wasn't going to be one of those people or one of those athletes when I retired when I said, oh, I'm going to be down the track twice a week. No, I don't want to. I literally found other interests and I found other things to kind of occupy my time. I think, you know, I spent so many years in track and field and I'm grateful for those years. But I, I also try to work out as much as I can. One, because I want to be fit and just kind of maintain some sort of fitness. But also because... I look at the picture, and this is maybe for vanity purposes, but I look at those pictures of when I had like, you know, a six pack or eight pack, and I'm like, oh my word, like, I don't feel like the same person, <laughs> same person, because the sessions I'm doing are not as intense. And also related to that, once I retired, I remember having a lot of conversations with a lot of my peers, especially the women who'd retired. And I asked them questions about, oh, how do you maintain that level of fitness? Do you feel insecure about your body changing? Because all of them would say, you know, you're not training six, seven days a week anymore. Like that goes out the window. You've got all the commitments. You've got work, you've got life, you've got job, you've got kids. You're on the road all the time. Like you you may get a gut, uh, you may put on an extra five or 10 kilos. You may look different, but ultimately do whatever makes you happy. So I think with me personally, I'm trying to find that balance. Uh, I think I'm doing a pretty good job of it. I think because there is an expectation when you do retire, people expect you to look the same. But I'm also like, mm, I'm allowed not to. If I if I look heavier or if I look lighter or slimmer or skinnier, then that's kind of my prerogative as opposed to the expectations of other people. Making that transition from being a professional athlete to almost like the second having a second career now, because you're you're 30, you're 37 at the moment, you're gonna be 38 in October. You're still yeah. so young. You've got you, you know, <laughs> like 20, 30 years of working before, you know, the before you hit like 60, 65 or so. Yeah. How have you been figuring out like what it is that you want to do and how you want to spend your time like what's that process look like for you when I retired I, I had a list of things I wanted to do um some of them worked out really well some of them didn't and then also COVID impacted a lot of those things I think it was really tough for me to figure out what's gonna not just not so much elevate me 
But you, you feel like, because you've been in professional sport for so many years, or the majority of your life, you feel as though, you know, you're never going to be able to get that high again. But I think now I actually feel okay and comfortable with the decisions that I've made. So as a day-to-day consultant working for like a global firm, they are super, super supportive and they allow me to any, you know, sport and activities or commitments. Say if I've got like a corporate visit to do to like a business where I'm giving a talk or speech or I'm on a panel, I can do if I've got like a school visit that I need to do. They're really good at that as well. They'll give me the time off. If I want to take a day off here and there, just if I've got other commitments, they are really, really flexible with that. I think if I was just doing that on a day-to-day basis, I'd probably, me personally, I'd probably go mad. (laughs) So I'm grateful for the fact that during the promotion of this book, for example, I was able to take time off and take time away but also realise, oh, I've got client work I need to be doing. But it's, it is an actual great balance. It's, I guess managing my time has been tough at times. But yeah, it's, it's, it has been really fun and really enjoyable. But I always tell athletes because they're always like, how did you find your feet in this? And what did you end up doing? And I always tell them, like, honestly, you know, there's no rule book. There's no guide. You just have to figure out what what is it that you want to do? What are you passionate about? What is going to give you the same level of drive that you had when you were competing at the highest level? And it can be in anything, in any area, in any sector. If it means you have to go and study, then you go back and study. If it means you need to take exams, you need to revise for, then you go and do it. So, for example, I really wanted to sit on boards and be part of the change when it comes to decision making and be able to challenge people on the decisions that they make. So in order for me to do that, I needed to learn about it. So the FA had a course they were doing for current and retired athletes. And it was mainly in football. Then it's been extended to other sports. So because my brother, who was previously head of the Players Football Association, he told me about it. So it was like a corporate governance course. So learning all the ins and outs about corporate governance. So I was on the course last year. And we would have virtual sessions at once a month with study sessions in between with exams and essays that you have to do. It has to be completed by this time, done by this. So I went through it for like the course was around nine, nine, ten months or so. It was really tough in the beginning. And then at the end, you got an exam. So my exam, which I studied for day and night, like weeks and weeks and weeks. It was so intense. And then um, I passed my exam in March so yeah I'm basically certified to sit on any board in the world and be able to offer help and support and advice and be able to challenge people in the decisions that they've made I do want to move into sports but I also want to do things in business as well because that is also something I'm passionate about so I think it's just about finding your passions and what suits you again if it's not something that you like there's so many other things that you can do as well who have been the role models? Who have been the women that have inspired you, who you've looked up to? I think in in sports, I would probably say Denise Lewis, who's a former Olympic champion for Great Britain in the heptathlon. I think she's someone who I always just loved and adored when I was growing up. Outside the track and field, it has to be Serena Williams. Mm. She's just incredible. Like everything about Serena, I just adore. And, you know, I had the amazing opportunity to, you know, actually see her at the Olympic Games or meet her rather <clears throat> at the Olympic Games in London 2012. And she was just really nice. She, you know, she was getting mobbed by people, but she would sit there and have a conversation with you. And, you know, when, you know, the saying where you should be, where people say, oh, you should never meet your idols. Yeah. Like, yes, I've met, I've met a few like celebrities and high profile people. And I'm like, hmm. You weren't really that nice. <laughs> but with Serena, <laughs> it was the complete opposite. She was so nice. She was just so chilled out. Yeah, and she was just really, really cool. So she she was just amazing. Loved every bit of it. Yeah. For young girls now who are wanting to move into the world of, you know, becoming a professional athlete, becoming become a runner, they have the dream of going to the Olympics. And obviously, it's such a massively broad question. But, you know, what advice would you have what would be your top tips for them I would probably say um 
find out what, what, why is it that you want to do it? So without overthinking it, why did you start? So the reason why I say that is because in those years towards the end, you always ask yourself, like, if you're carrying an injury or if you're going through some sort of difficulty or if you're on the track absolutely dying and you just want more recovery because your coach is screaming at you or you just feel like you want to give up. I always ask myself why I started. And all I can picture is young Annika at Waverly Athletic Centre or Waverly Athletics Track and just running freely. So that Annika wasn't adulting. She was just running because she, she loved it. It was so enjoyable. She was so passionate about it and she wanted to get better. When I think about that moment, I always think whenever I've got, mo- got a moment of doubt, that is the first thing I think about. So why is it that I started? That's what I ask myself. So that's what I try to tell people. And I know it sounds really basic and probably very easy, but have fun. Like, it's so easy to get caught up in maybe the political side or maybe you think, oh, I'm not good enough. You know, there's loads of self-doubt. There's loads of, sometimes you think of, um, you know, self-sabotage, which I was, you know, really good at, unfortunately, at times. I used to tell myself, I'm not good enough at this, not good enough at that. But then I would actually remember how amazing I was and how how much of a badass I was at, at just being at this high level. When you think about all these people who live on the planet and you get to compete in an Olympic arena and you're only one of like a couple of thousand people in the world who've ever become Olympians, but only a couple of hundred people in the world who've become Olympic medalists. So when you start to now narrow it down, you start to think, oh, like what I did was actually pretty cool. So that's what I try to tell myself. When Sometimes people can try to put a negative spin and say things like, well, you know, it wasn't yours to have. You know, you shared it with four people or, you know, you were just part of that puzzle. And it's like, no, like <laughs> the team also probably wouldn't have won the medal if it wasn't for me. So I know what part I played. So I try to tell that to people. But I always remember to have fun. I had so much fun in those moments. like. Yeah, so that's what I try to tell the young girls. And also as well, when you are in those years, so I think the dropout rate, I believe, is like 15 to 17 or 16 to 18. And I think in those years, as a young girl, you do have other interests. You do want to hang out with your friends. You want to go out clubbing. You want to go to bars. You want to take up other interests. I just decided not to. And my friends were actually really supportive of me. They were super, super supportive. And I would just be like, no, I'll do it another time. I want to focus on this. I'm glad I did it. And I'm glad I stuck by it because I probably wouldn't be sitting here to tell you how much all of those moments meant to me. But or I also probably wouldn't have written a book about it. Or it probably wouldn't have been, it probably wouldn't have been as dramatic or exciting. And talking of a little fun, and I'm sure you get asked this question all the time, but where do you keep your Olympic medal? It's actually in a safe, you know, Sarah. Oh, that's it's good. Actually, yeah, it's actually in a safe. So I only bring it out if I need to, but I try to put it like in a in, in the safe. So it's not in my house in the safe, but it's in <laughs> It's in a safe. Oh, oh, yeah. I was going to say, you don't need to get that specific. (laughs) Do you you have like a success wall or do you have like framed photos of those magical moments from your career? Do you know what? I don't yet because I'm in the process of moving house, but my mom does. When you walk into the family home, she has like, it's like a shrine, (laughs) I call it. (laughs) It's like a shrine of photos and, and medals like from, you know, early years. And it's swamped by it's swamped by medals and certificates and photos of me. But there's also pictures of my brother because he won basketball trophies as well. My brother cheers. <laughs> Sometimes when I've been back at home and I hear, um, you know, there's a builder that's coming or a plumber or an electrician, and it's the first thing you see because when you open the door, you'll you'll automatically think, "Well, what's going on here?" So you'll automatically turn left, and and the first thing they say is, "Oh." sorry for your loss because that's what it looks like it literally <laughs> looks like a shrine and then they see me and they're like what like what is going on and so it just looks crazy and I keep telling her like just take it all down but she won't because my mum is like my biggest fan and she's super proud of me um 
So yeah, I can't I can't ask her to do that. Plus people she she actually likes showing it off. She likes people asking questions and stuff. So so yeah. So for people who are thinking, oh, well, I love hearing about your story. I want to get the book. I want to read more. They want to know more. What can they expect from your book? And who who do you, who would you recommend the book for? Obviously everybody, but if there is like a particular aim, who would you who would it be aimed at? The book isn't aimed at one particular person. The reason being is because, like, yes, my story is about me as a young black girl growing up in Liverpool, and you know there are there are moments where I talk about racism and you know trigger warning, sexual assault, and abuse and suicide as well. So I do talk about all of these things, but I also know that there's a lot of good things that I do talk about because there's a lot of good things and funny, funny things that I've experienced in my life. So yes, you don't necessarily have to be a black woman to relate to my experience. You could be a woman at work who feels like you're being bullied or you feel like you're being, um, you know, just working in an environment where there's loads of sexism and misogyny or you feel like you're not valued, or you feel like you're not heard, or you could be a young girl coming up in the sport and you're going through the same body image issues that I had when I was coming up in the sport, where your confidence feels as though it's being battered, you feel like you're not good enough, and again, you do feel like, okay, is this something that I want to do? So you start to question certain things. And then I talk about funny moments, like almost getting killed by a drug dealer when I used to work in a hotel in Liverpool and missing training. The one time I missed training to go to a Jamaica concert um, and I didn't tell my coach and to this day I don't think he knows unless he's read the book. So there are some really, really good funny moments as well. I think it offers insight into what it's really like to be a high level track and field athlete or sportswoman and be British, like what does it mean to be British to you? So I talk a lot about my identity, my race, my culture, not being deemed British enough. But then when people hear you speak, they're like, oh, are you from Liverpool? Because they sometimes will say stuff like, oh, wait, there's black people who live in Liverpool. Because, you know, that's something, unfortunately, that you do get nowadays. So it's a book for all. And I really, really hope everyone enjoys it. And Annika, where can people connect with you, follow you on the socials? Where's the best place? Where are you most active? So my socials are on Twitter. It, it is at Annie Onora. So at A-N-N-Y-O-N-U-O-R-A. On, and on Instagram is at Annika. So at A-N-Y-I-K-A. Facebook is Annika Onora as well. And yeah, that's where you'll probably find me. Thank you so much for coming on Tucker Podcast. It's been amazing to chat to you. Just incredible what you achieved. And thank you so much for writing such a powerful book. I will be sharing all of the links to your social media, to the book, so that people can follow along and keep up to date with what the future is going to hold for you. Thank you again for coming on Tough Girl Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Hey Tribe, how are you doing? I hope you enjoyed the episode with Anika. Now, if you're brand new to the Tough Girl podcast and you are here for the first time, you've probably realized that sometimes with episodes, I just like to get straight into the conversation. There's eight seconds of music at the start and then we get straight into the guests, introducing themselves. There's no fluff, it's straight into the content. We learn more about the guests, who they are, their childhood, their adventures, their challenges, the lessons that they've learned, the obstacles that they've overcome and faced. And they share more about their joys and their passions. And it's all about giving you that information to motivate and inspire you with your life, whatever challenges that you are currently facing at the moment. Sometimes I do do an introduction at the start and I tell you a little bit more about who I am, but obviously I didn't do that this time. But let me do that right now for you. So my name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges, which is all about motivating and inspiring women and girls and increasing the amount of female role models in the media. And one of the ways that I do that is by sharing these stories. There's now over 500 episodes of the Tough Girl podcast available for you to listen to, free for you to listen to. It's on all major platforms, iTunes, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud. I think it's even on YouTube. Plus iHeartRadio, Google Play, all of the listening platforms it should be available on. What I would love for you to do is how we get these stories out there is if, is by you 
by the power of you telling one friend about the Tough Girl podcast. So if you've got a friend who you work with, if you've got a friend in a running group, a cycling club, and you think, you know what, I really enjoyed this episode. I think it would really add a lot of value. Please tell one friend about the Tough Girl podcast. Share it on social media. Tag me in it. I'm at toughgirlchallenges.com. It really does make a massive difference in sharing these incredible stories and these incredible women who are doing amazing things. Everything that we have talked about today will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. And the website is basically the main central hub. So that's where you should go if you're looking for more inspiration or if there's a specific area that you're interested in, whether it's running, ultra running, sailing, kayaking, mountaineering, swimming, ultra cycling, exploring, I'm forgetting all of the incredible women that we've, that we've spoken to, then yeah, go and visit toughgirlchallenges.com. Have a look through the website. There's also more information about me and my background. So obviously one of the things that I do is I interview and talk to a lot of women, but I can't just be out there talking the talk. I have, you know, I want to be out there doing the challenges as well so that I can really understand what is going on. And that is what I've been doing through Tough Girl Challenges. I've taken on a whole variety of of different challenges myself from running the marathon to Saab, so through hiking the Appalachian Trail to cycling down the Pacific Coast Highway to most recently walking around the coast of Wales. So I walked the Wales Coastal Path, which or Wales Coast Path, which is 870 miles, which I did in 50 days. Those vlogs are coming out now on the Tough Girl YouTube channel. They're about between eight to 12 minutes long and they're just sort of a daily glimpse of what it is like when you're on a through hike, when you are on a challenge. So they come out every Wednesday and Friday on the Tough Girl YouTube channel. So please do go and check it out. Just want to give you a little heads up about our next episode. So new episodes every Tuesday and on the 27th of September, we are going to be speaking with Molly Huddle. So Molly is a long distance runner. She's a two-time Olympian and she's just recently co-authored a book of how she did it, a high performance guide for female distance runners. So Molly is American. She's won 28 USA titles. She's held six American record and she's competed in like four major marathons. So the book that she just recently co-authored was how she did it was co-authored with college coach Sarah Slatley. The book is basically the ultimate roadmap for female distance runners. There's 50 interviews with women who've made it. Plus, there's also key information from professionals. So talking about athletic excellence, trainers, physicians, nutritionists, sports psychologists, etc. So Molly comes on Tough Girl Podcast and we get to learn more about her journey into becoming a professional athlete. You know, what it was like um, in her childhood and younger years, how she got into running quite when she qualified for the National Cross Country Championships, you know, setting a national record in high school for the two mile distance. Um, she also talks more about being pregnant with her first child and what it's like entering her first third trimester and how she runs while she is pregnant. She also talks in detail about mantras and finding powerful words, running the London Marathon, her goal of wanting to rub a, run a sub 2.25 marathon she talks about strategy she talks about her new podcast keeping the keeping track podcast and her passion for sharing athletes stories so again another incredible inspiring woman and i think you'd really enjoy this that episode so if you listen to this episode and enjoyed it then i think you'll love the next episode with molly huddle massive thank you again for listening to the tough girl podcast tell one friend about it and if you'd like to support the work that I do, then please visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. All that's left for me to say is wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it your all, give it 110%, get after it, go for it, believe in yourself because I believe in you. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.